Good morning. Welcome to Bethel's online church experience. I'm so glad that you've joined with us today. My name is Sarah Beth. I'm your host this morning. While you're watching this morning, why don't you jump on the chat and say hello to those that are also watching. And if you're watching this at a later time, then I hope that you will check out our website, www.bethelpc.ca and sign up for our e-news. Drop us an email there. Let us know that you watch the service. And also, if you have anything that you'd like us to pray for, you can email those in to us and we would be happy to pray with you. We give as an act of worship. And right now we have created some easy ways to make that act of worship available to you. So you can give by donating online through e-transfer or our website. You can also mail in your giving. If you have any questions about that, please feel free to contact us. Every Tuesday night, we have a prayer group that meets on Zoom, and I encourage you, if you have not yet signed up for this but would like to participate, you are welcome to do so. You can sign up on our website. So just before we meet Pastor Ken in the sanctuary, we have a few familiar faces that want to say hi. Hello, everyone. Terry Williams here from Straffordville. Just wanted to say hi to my Bethel family. I, we're all grounded again, so stay home, stay safe, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Bye. Good morning, church family. Uh, I just hope that you are all doing uh, well and staying safe today. Uh, I would just like to read for you this morning, uh, Titus 1, 5 through 9. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient, since an overseer, manage, overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it.
song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like. None beside you Open up my eyes in wonder And show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love To those around me Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you COVID-19, our society seems to be going through some significant discipline challenges. Things like hand washing, six-foot distancing, wearing masks, face shields. And if this COVID-19 continues for another six months, and I pray that it doesn't, then we're probably going to find that they've become part of the everyday life that we have. 
I'm still working on it. I, I go to a store and I still have to think about getting the mask out of my uh, glove box to be able to make sure that I'm, I'm properly attired to be able to go into, into the store. But as we continue on, these things that are challenges right now will become part of our everyday life through the discipline of having to do it. But as a society, we are rather resistant to discipline and the change involved. And you can see from different ones that react in different ways to the fact that we have to wear masks and they don't want to wear masks or they don't want to social distance or they want to gather together in groups and the government has to impose penalties if someone violates those things. We just know that as a uh, society that we are, are, are resistant and, and the, uh, to the discipline that is required to be able to get there. I know that I was listening to an interview of a of a, an Olympic athlete, and he was talking about the discipline that it took in order for them to get to the place where they were to be able to compete. And so the spiritual disciplines that we have that come from the Word of God, I think, are as important as any of the other things that we are going, that we do you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. And discipline doesn't, as I said, come easy. It remind me of a story of a, a little boy in the church, and <clears throat> he was misbehaving to the point that he needed to be removed. And as he was going out through the back door, someone, he yelled out, could someone please pray for me? Because he knew what was coming, especially back in the day when I was younger, I knew it was coming, and so I, I would behave myself. And so uh, I know that uh, the discipline that needs to be applied sometimes can be a lot more uh, challenging to us than perhaps at other times. But we, we live in a day that those disciplines need to be put. Uh, in Titus 1, it referring, it's referring to elders, and it says in verse 8, rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. And so discipline is a part of who we are. In Hebrews 12, for us as believers, verses 4 through 10, it says, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father, addresses his son. It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. And he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate. You are not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. And so I found that as I've, I've visited various churches, as I've gotten to know uh, various believers, and even in my own life, I realize that sometimes it's easy to drift away from the disciplines that God is encouraging us from his word. And by uh, drifting away, then we, we invoke other things that are coming. And our Father loves us to the point that he will discipline us. That is what the word is saying to us here in Hebrews. Is that fathers discipline true sons and daughters. Not from a place of being angered. Not from a place of being mean. Not from a place of trying to control. But from a place of being able to protect them. And so it's really important that we need to look in to what uh, God is saying to us in order to be able to have the disciplines that are necessary for us to live. This is the uh, part one of a two-part series uh, of, that I wanted to share with you. And so I'm going to go through the, the first five things uh, right now with you. And then I'll be doing part two a little later on. We'll let you know when that happens. First of all, we need to have our priorities in right order. I think that it's important for us to realize that when we put God first, it says that everything else would be added to us when we put him in the place of, the, uh, in the position of, of first place in our hearts. And sometimes other things, the cares of this world, the, the challenges that we face sometimes, they will take on uh, 
a, a, a heavier meaning or a, a different spot in our hearts when God is saying, no, look to me, trust me, call on me, and I'll be there to be, help you. You see, if we put the, those priorities, that we, how we live our lives in the right order, I believe that, first of all, God, secondly, is our family, which I believe is our spouse and our children, Thirdly would be our job and career. In other words, what, what, is, what do we use in, in order to be able to provide for our families and provide for ourselves? And then friends and then ourselves. As we do this, we need to uh, come to a place of saying, all right, God, you are first. You are first in my life. You are first in my family's life. And sometimes he can get set, set aside. I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about God. Even though the church is part of what we do when we come together, but the truth is God is our Father, is with us constantly. We just have to realize that and invite him into every circumstance that we face. And when we do that, then we are setting our priority right in the sense of, of having him there with us. Because the second most important thing that I think we need to do in terms of being disciplined is prayer and fasting. In other words, we need to be able to set time to be able to pray, which is to be able to talk to God. It's not a flowery speech. It's not something where we dictate to God. As a matter of fact, we should praise God far more than we should ever ask of God. Now, God encourages us to ask him. It says you have little because you ask not, but we just need to realize that as we ask, it's also to give him praise and to be able to give him glory. And the third part of prayer, I believe that is the most important, is to listen. We are not a listening society. We tend to want to speak and listen little. But the truth is we need to listen much and speak little. Because when we do that, then we'll hear what God is saying to us. It may not be in an audible voice. It may not be through, through a, a normal uh, patterns and things, but, or, or even through what we think would be from pastors or teachers and so on. But it's the Word of God that, sharpen, that brings us into a, a true focus. And so when we pray, we realize that that Word needs to come into our hearts. And that word helps us to be able to hear what God is saying. And so the prayer is not what we ask for, it's what we hear from. We hear from God so that we are able to do his will. We need to set that in the right place as a discipline. And the fasting part of it, the word talks about fasting. In other words, setting aside something. In other words, it's taking something that is in our fleshly desires and setting it aside so that we can have our spiritual desires met. In other words, we take food and we set it aside. We can take perhaps television or our gaming consoles or all the other stuff that we have, and we set it aside and we fast. In other words, we take time away from that. I'm not saying that that, uh, some of those things are not important. We do need to eat. We do need to drink water. We do need to... Well, maybe not. We don't need television. We don't need all the gaming consoles, but it's all part of our society. But when we set aside something in the flesh in order to honor God, then we are truly disciplining ourselves, disciplining our flesh to be submitted to what the Holy Spirit wants to do in us. Sometimes we can become so busy with life that we do not set the time aside. And fasting is one way of being able to remind ourselves that our lives are based on what God does, not based on the stuff that we put in place around us. We need to discipline ourselves to be able to pray and be able to fast. And I know that there are folks that uh, they, they need to eat three meals a day. They need to care for themselves because physically uh, they, they just need all of that. And I'm not necessarily talking about that, but there may be something that you do that you can just set aside for a short season whether it be a a lunch period or whether it be an evening where you might normally watch television or a time when you've set aside time to be able to to play with one of the video games and things like that if you're a young person. As you set that time aside, I believe that God would meet you spiritually because you've set aside the physical. In other words, you've denied yourself and you've said, Lord, you are more important than anything else that I do. 
That's what fasting is all about. That's why the Lord encouraged the disciples. Remember, they had difficulty being able to break through in prayer. And Jesus said to them, this only comes out through prayer and fasting. Because there needed to be something that they would set aside in their lives that would release fully what God wanted to do in a situation that they were calling on him for. And so as we set that as a discipline in our, in our hearts and in our minds, and not only just to pray with yourself, also to be able to pray with someone else. It's amazing to me how many folks that I've come across in church are really shy about praying collectively. As a matter of fact, they're so shy, I've met men who, who are reluctant to even pray with their spouse. They're afraid that they won't look proper, or they won't say the right things, or that they, they, they will come across as being perhaps unspiritual or less spiritual than their spouse does. Well, I'm telling you that's a lie from the enemy, and that he wants to bring you into a deep relationship with him and with the one that you love, whether it be your spouse, whether it be your children, whether it be a friend, whether it be a co-worker, someone that that uh, you have confidence in that as you agree together in prayer, it says that God would, would do great and wondrous things when two or three are gathered together in his name. And so <clears throat> when you take this time, this discipline of prayer, praying with your spouse, and I, I've experienced times when, when I was offering some, some counseling to couples and I would ask them if they would pray together. I asked them if they were praying at that particular time, and usually the answer in the middle of the difficulty was no, they weren't. But I tell you, if you take time to pray with your wife, take time to pray with your husband, take time to pray with someone, there is both an accountability to it, but it also brings you into a partnership with the Lord to be able to accomplish the purpose of what he's called on you to do. So first of all, we have to set our priorities in right order. Secondly, we need to pray and fast. And the third is that we need to set aside time to be able to do devotions. In other words, to read and study the the Word of God. And to be able to meditate on that Word. You see, meditating isn't just thinking about it. Meditating is allowing the Holy Spirit as we... as we recall it in our minds, to be able to speak to us in ways perhaps that we didn't see it initially. The Word of God is sharp. The Word of God is capable of speaking to us when we perhaps did not recognize what the words that are written on the paper say, but as we meditate on it, then usually the Holy Spirit will bring something out of that that is going to help to give us the answers that we need to be able to live life the way that He intends for us. You see, as we meditate on the Word of God, and it's not just to be able to read and study the Bible, to be able to tick it off and say, oh, I've read uh, three chapters today. Good for me. No, it's not like that. This discipline is such that you read until you sense that the Spirit has spoken to your heart. Sometimes that can happen with one word. Other times it may be just one, one uh, verse that you've read from a portion of Scripture that all of a sudden it just came alive to you. It was like that uh, for me with the Titus 1 and 8. And it says, rather he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. It was that word discipline that was the part that really spoke to me about have, uh, this message, discipline in the way that I lived. And so it's important for each of us to realize that the Word of God is what gives us that information that we need. And so when we set it into our hearts and into our minds, then we know that God will go before us and that He will help us and that He is such a faithful God. So first of all, is the priorities in order. Second is prayer and fasting. Third is the reading and study the Word of God. And that uh, it's important to be able to allow that Word of God to wash over our hearts and minds. As we read this Word, and sometimes you watch, the enemy is going to try to get you off track. I remember my grandmother, she, she would say when she had insomnia, she'd get the Word of God and begin to ray, uh, uh, I should say, read it. And within minutes, she'd be asleep. And the truth is, is that it'll not only bring you calmness, but at the same time, the enemy doesn't want you reading it, so he's going to bring about slumber to you. I guess that was the whole idea. Um, But the truth is, is that as we wait on God, and and we learn from his word, 
then we are going to be able to follow the truth of what that word tells us. Because we're living in a society that is built upon lies. The untruth. And the untruth has us so distorted in in terms of how we are to live as a society. We are concerned about what our gender is. We're concerned about how we relate to one another. We're, we're concerned because, you know, with the social media, it's no longer getting together to talk about things. It's sending you an Instagram or to be able to uh, uh, send, send you something that, uh, a text or, or other means of being able to communicate. What the truth is, is that God wants us to discipline ourselves so that we hear the Word of God. And because not only just hearing the Word of God, but being obedient to it. When we are obedient to the word of God, then we will see that is what takes our belief then to faith. When we act on our belief by reading the word of God, taking it in, and then acting on it, then it releases the faith. And so faith comes by hearing and hearing by that word of God. And so we just need to trust God for that. The fourth one is that... uh, We just need to realize that the discipline of forgiveness is crucial for all of us. You see, the enemy, he wants to keep us in turmoil. He wants to keep us separated. He wants to create a division between us. And even in the closest families, in the closest relationships, any time he can get a foothold in, he tries to do so. And usually it's around this issue, the issue of forgiveness. You see, we, also, we, we not only need to seek forgiveness for ourselves, but we need to extend forgiveness then to others. And forgiveness comes it, truly as we wait on God, as we invite him to be the Lord of our lives, then when we've given that to him, then forgiveness flows to us because, through him. But the expectation is for us to be able to stay in that place of forgiveness is that we are then to be able to forgive others. He gives us the example of, of the, uh, uh, the one who owed the servant who owed another servant money. First of all, this one servant, he owed the, the, the uh, uh, estate owner an incredible amount of money. And uh, he was thrown into prison, but he, he went before the state owner and asked for his for, for forgiveness, and the state owner forgave him of everything that was owed. But this same servant, he then went to another servant that owed him relatively little compared to what that other one owed, and he uh, took and put him into, into jail and would not forgive him of anything. And Jesus said, no, the kingdom of heaven is not like that. You see, we need the discipline of not only being able to receive forgiveness, but also to be able to extend forgiveness to others. Because the truth is, is that until we are able to to, uh, forgive one another, it will hold us into the bondage that comes from that. And the bitterness will arise in our hearts. And we see bitterness all throughout our our, uh, world as People hold things in their hearts in unforgiveness against others because of things that perhaps have gone on in the past. For some, it could be generations ago, and they do not even know the exact thing that was done that started it, but it continues on, and you can see it in nations and in countries around the world. And even some of it continues in our own countries, in our country of Canada, in the United States. And so a lot of the turmoil that you've seen is because of this unforgiveness. Well, God said, that is not the discipline that you need. You need the discipline of reconciliation and forgiveness. Now, reconciliation is a little different because it's between you and me, where forgiveness is always between you and God. But I, you become the recipient of my forgiveness if there's something that I'm holding on to against you. And so I make sure that whether it be my spouse or my kids or people I work with or friends, that there's nothing that holds that back because when there's a barrier there, then the enemy has every every, uh, capacity to be able to bring destruction into my life. And the Lord doesn't want us to live in a destructive behavior. He wants to live in a a time of holiness, in a time of of, uh, uh, togetherness to be able to come And forgiveness is the way to do that. 
The fifth thing, and I just want to share with this, and this is the end of, of uh, this first part, is that we need to have the discipline of being able to tithe. When we tithe, then we are taking from ourselves our life's energy when we've, when we've created uh, income to be able to support our family, but we are recognizing the fact that God gave us the ability, that God gave us the life force, that God put us the breath into our lungs and that he's given us the capacity to be able to work and to be able to take part of that and to be able to honor him with the first parts of what he's given to us. In Malachi 3 and 10, there are actually five-fold blessing that comes when we tithe. When we are faithful with this discipline, I believe that God is not only honored, but it releases him to be able to bring to you these five things. First of all, it says the windows of heaven will be open. And I'm praying that there will be an open heaven over Tilsonburg and over Ontario and over Canada and around the world, that there would be an open heaven for us to receive all that God has. Because God has it there to be able to bestow upon us, but it's not so that we get something, it's so that we are blessed to be able to share with others and to be able to bless others. The second thing it says that all nations will call you blessed. In other words, the nation that we are part of will be a blessed nation when we are faithful with the tithe. So when we do our part, it enables the whole to be able to function in a way that is blessed. It says that the devourer would be rebuked. In other words, the one who wants to take from you, which is the enemy of your soul, which is Satan, that devourer, he comes and he has access to the stuff that we do not submit unto God. You see, when we give the 10%, which it says in the Word of God is what the tithe represents, it really says that the 90% is going to cover far more than 100% will. Now you say, well, mathematically, that doesn't make any sense. And I'm telling you, if you think about it, tithing does not make sense. But in God's economy, because the income of heaven is faith, and so when we invoke faith, then we're invoking the, the, the uh, capacity to be able to bring about what God said he would, and that the devourer would then be rebuked. In other words, he's going to get the 10% anyway. In other words, your car isn't going to last as long, your house is going to need more repairs, the relationships that you have are going to be destroyed. But God said, no, if you do this first, then everything else will take its place and it'll be a blessing to you. And so the devourer is buked that he cannot take that any longer. So what he would come is he would take that 10%. Because when, you, when we place it before God and we surrender it back to him, then we receive the full blessing of everything that he said that he would provide. And so the devourer is then rebuked. And it says there will be a bountiful yield of the harvest. And we've just gone through the harvest time. And that the Lord said that there would be a bounty in that. In other words, that there would be the sufficient rain and, and that the ground would be fertile and, and that we would be able to receive back. In other words, what we receive will be a bountiful harvest when we've sown like this. And finally, it says that there is a blessing that is poured out that is uncontainable. And for some of you, you're living in a situation where you lack and it's, uh, there's a poverty that you have in your life that you're not able to accomplish everything that God said that, that he had for you to do. But the truth is, is that when we're obedient and honor God, that there is blessing that is uncontainable. Now, it may not always come in finance, but the blessing comes in many variety of ways, whether it be in relationships, whether it be in, in uh, successes, whether it be in, in things that you, you want to do, I found that when I can call on God and I've been faithful, then I receive blessing that is far greater than what I could ever produce myself. And God is a faithful God. And I'm thankful to him for the blessings that I have. I've been, uh, the Lord has helped me. I learned this in this discipline I put in my life when I was seven. 
at the time when I gave my heart to the Lord, and my mom said, you need to begin to tithe. Now, she helped me out in the first part, and as I got a paper route, I began to tithe. I've never stopped. I've never lacked for a job. I've never lacked for resources. There have been times that it's been tough, and it's been tight. But I can tell you for sure that God has always provided for me. And he will do the same for you. This is a discipline that the enemy does not want you to have. And I know that it's a challenge in many churches. And it's a challenge for many believers because we live so close, hand to mouth. But God doesn't want us to live that way. He wants us to enjoy the full blessing. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you hear and you answer our prayers. Thank you that you're with us. No matter what, Lord, we know that you go before us. Bless this day. Protect these folks, Lord. Help them as they put disciplines into their life. The enemy's going to resist them. He's going to create all kinds of problems because some of these things require time to be able to do it. But Lord, I just pray that you would open the windows of heaven and that, Lord, you would bless them and that you would help them. Lord, as they make the determination, we just take one step and you take thousands to us. So, Lord, we step towards you right now in Jesus' name. Amen.